Our Father in heaven, we are in your presence for the single purpose of hearing your word and interacting with you through that word. I ask in the name of Jesus to remember the promise you made to Moses in Exodus chapter 4 verse 12 when you said to him, Now therefore go and I will be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Father, in the name of Jesus, teach me what I should say and open the eyes of those who are listening that they may behold wondrous things out of thy word. I pray with confidence from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When I was counseling at the University of Michigan, and I was there for 15 years, one of the things that the students always desired very earnestly was the privilege of entering into a mentoring relationship with someone far advanced in the field that they desired to enter. Uh, particularly when I moved to the medical school to counsel there, many students from the very first year of medical school wanted to do research with some leading light in that particular area of interest that the student had because they reasoned that it would only be advantageous to the applications to uh, some residency program three or four years down the road. And so they made earnest efforts and asked me for letters of recommendation so that they could work with these experts in their fields, a mentoring relationship. In the social sciences, we have a lot of emphasis placed on having young boys have a relationship with, uh, with uh, mature men, men who are about something in their lives, men who have accumulated some degree of success, men who live lives that are upright, and so that these young boys can see that kind of life and perhaps be influenced by that life to live similarly. And the same applies for young ladies. The, the, the experience of mentoring is regarded to be a very high, high value indeed. And so it is. God is the originator of the mentoring relationship. And I'll try to demonstrate that from scriptures five minutes to eight. I'll keep you abreast of the time so you don't have to be worried at any time whatsoever. God is the originator of the mentoring relationship in his own unique way. Because from creation, it has always been God's desire that he and we would have a relationship that is ongoing and unbroken. That was his original desire. And it remains his desire despite the introduction of this catastrophe called sin. I say again, it has always been God's desire to have a mentoring relationship with his creation. Now, let's take a look at creation and learn something about God. Let us go to Romans chapter 1. We shall begin reading at verse 16. Romans chapter 1. Please share your Bible with someone next to you who does not have one. Romans chapter 1. Reading from verse 16. And I read from the King James Version. Do you have Romans chapter 1? Reading from verse 16. The Bible says, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Now, focus on verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Let us re-examine verse 20. For the invisible things of him, meaning the qualities of God, the traits of God, the personality of God, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Let's pause. The Bible tells us it is possible to learn something about God by observing what he has created. In other words, let me put it this way, there are detectives Psychologists who work with uh, 
the criminal society, by that I mean the FBI and all other agencies that work to solve crimes, and they can learn about the mindset of a criminal by studying the details of that person's crime. So that they, on the basis of the crime committed, can develop a profile of the criminal. And what is amazing is that so often they are astonishingly correct. Now, God is no criminal. God is the creator of that which is good. And he tells us, examine what I have done and you will develop a profile of me of sufficient detail for you to make an intelligent decision regarding how you will relate to me. And so the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, the Bible says, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. And the verse is so arrogant, if I may say that, it concludes by saying, so that they are without excuse. It is impossible to look around with an honest eye and a similarly on his heart, and not conclude that there is a God. So that who God is, is somehow reflected in what God does. Let me repeat that. Who God is, may be detected in what God does. Because there is no line of demarcation between God, who he is, and God what he does. Now, keeping this principle in mind that God can be seen to some degree, not completely, no one can grasp God completely, but God has made evidence of himself known in what he has created so that those who examine honestly may come in contact with this God. Psalm 19, reading verse 1. This verse also bears out this proposition. Psalm 19, reading verse 1. Do you have Psalm 19? I'm sure you know the verse, verse 1. I can hear the pages, it's 8 o'clock, we have half an hour to go, 35 minutes. Do you have 19 of Psalm, verse 1? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Now, here we have evidence again, that by examining the creation of God, we see evidence of God. The heavens, you look up in the sky, they declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. The detail that went into creation, the sense of artistry, the, the, the sense of beauty, the predilection for symmetry and proportion, all of this can be seen by an honest, and I must stress the word honest, examination of the heavens and of course the earth. Let's go to Job chapter 12. Job 12 verses 6 and 7. The title of this evening's message by the way is A Marriage Made in Heaven. Job chapter 12 reading verses 6 and 7. What can you tell me about Job? Anything? According to Adventist uh, beliefs. Who wrote the book of Job? Moses. And the book of Job is supposed to express some of the oldest events next to creation in scripture. Uh, we know Job lost all his children, ten in one day, all his possessions in one day, and yet he remained faithful to God. Could you have done that? Could I have done that? Read Job sometime and see that in the life of Job we have an example of a man who clearly in his life lived by this principle. I don't care what I lose. I don't care who I lose. I will not lose God. And that's a principle by which we must live. And so no matter what the devil did, Job remained faithful and God was able to lift Job up to the universe and brag on Job. Isn't it a beautiful thing when God can brag on you and me? Instead of turn away in shame and tears. Job 12 verses 6 and 7. But ask now the beasts and they shall do what? Teach thee and the fowls of the air and they shall tell thee or speak to the earth and it shall teach thee and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. What is Job saying? You want to understand something about the omnipotence of God? You go examine the animals. Look at them. 
Now, he doesn't expect you to talk to a cow, but study the lives of animals, study the fishes, look at a bird flying through the heavens, and if you look honestly, Job says, you will see something of the grandeur and the greatness of God. God, I say, is expressed in his creation, sufficient for us to know that there is a God. Now, let's go to Genesis chapter 2. As we continue, marriage made in heaven. Genesis chapter 2. Reading verse 7. Do we have that? Quickest book to find, Genesis or Revelation. Genesis 2 verse 7. Read with me. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now, look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. What does that say? Say it without looking. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When we think of the heaven, where do we point? And the earth? Now, in other words, in the beginning, God created the heavens up there and the earth down here. Look at the creation of Adam again in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of what? Where would you point? Down. Now down is not bad necessarily. Down in relation to what? That's all it is. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's the physical side of man. The verse goes on to say, and did what? And breathed into his nostrils what? The breath of life. Where did the breath of life come from? Above. Now, what does that tell you about man? Man, a living being, as Genesis 2, 7 expresses it, to be a living being, you need something from beneath and something from above. And the combination is put together not by someone from beneath, but by someone from above. In other words, before God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, what was before God? clay, or the Bible calls it dirt, earth, dust. Beautifully formed? Oh yes. Every pore in place? Yes. Every blood vessel? Yes. Every cell of the body? Yes. Was there life? No. And the same God who formed this thing from the dust of the earth, now he introduced an element from outside of the earth. And the lesson there seems to be that God's original desire was that our lives would be lived with the consciousness that heaven is involved and wants to be involved in all that we do. God wants to have a connection with us. And so we weren't made simply from the dust of the earth and some other earthly element was used to bring the life. The dust of the earth plus the breath from God. Something from beneath, something from above. And by the way, the Bible is clear. When we die, there is a separation. Both for animals and for people. God formed man of the dust of the earth. But man depends on some power from above. In order to live. I say that again. We are dependent on a power beyond us. In order for us to live. Let us see the concept of life depending on a source outside of us again. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. And let's read from verse 14 as we continue a marriage made in heaven. Genesis 1 reading from verse 14. Do you have that? The Bible says, and the Lord God said, and God, and God said, let us, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Now, we have the earth. Where do you point? Now, God said, let there be what? Lights, where? In the firmament of the heaven, where do you point? Up. 
to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be for light in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. They're way above from the earth but their purpose is to give light upon the earth now. And God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. Let us identify these bodies of light. We have the, and the, and the, what was one of their purposes? To give light upon the earth. Let me ask you this. When it is really cloudy, or if there's a volcanic explosion, and there's a thick dust cloud, what happens to the earth? It goes dark. For those of you who have tramped through forests, if you go through very thick forests like the rainforest of South America and some of the forest areas of uh, the Cameroon area, Congo area of, of Africa, when the, uh, the canopy is thick, what grows underneath it? When the canopy is thick, let me continue the description of the canopy, to the extent it shuts out sunlight. What grows beneath? Nothing. Why is that? You need sunlight. For one of the basic principles of life to take place, you need sunlight. Not sunlight just to see, but sunlight to live. At the foundation, at the very lowest rung of any food chain, what do you find? Plant life. God put the light, the sources of light, not on the earth. So that the earth is dependent on a source of life outside of itself. Twice, on two levels. First, mankind with respect to God and the natural world with respect to God's sources of light. The sun, the moon, the stars. The earth produces no light of its own. We produce no life of our own outside of a vital connection with God. Let me repeat, it has always been God's desire, 10 minutes after 8, to have a living connection with us. This is the way he feels about his creation. And so he put the breath of life into mankind. He breathed the breath of life into mankind. Let's learn something interesting about the animals. As we continue, a marriage made in heaven, a union made in heaven, a bond formed in heaven. Let's go to Genesis chapter 7, the chapter that tells us about the coming of the flood, the actual occurrence of the flood. The warning is in chapter 6, the flood comes in 7, it subsides in 8. God gives a covenant to, it, to Noah and his family in 9. Genesis 7, reading verse 17. The Bible says, and the flood was upon the earth, how long? Forty days. And the waters increased and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. And the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. Verse 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. Verse 21. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl and of cattle, and of beasts, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man. Look at verse 22. All in whose nostrils was what? The breath of life. Now what does that mean? All in whose nostrils was the breath of life. To define all, you go back to verse 21. And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, and of cattle, and of beasts, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life. Meaning the same breath of life that God breathed into the nostrils of Adam in Genesis 2-7 is the same breath of life in the fowls, in the cattle, in the beasts, in every living thing. So that the connection God wants with humankind is a connection he wants with the animal kingdom, the plant life, everything that came out of his creative hand. I am stressing tonight that God 
originally arranged for him or for him and for his creation at every level to have an unbroken connection, a vital relationship that would throb and pulse forever. And sin ruined that. How many parents sitting before me, your hearts are broken when one of your children, going contrary to the principles that guided your home, or goes off, leaves you, leaves the standards of the family, leaves the church, and goes off to a line of dissipation, and your heart is broken. Someone suffers divorce, and that person is devastated. There is a severing of a connection, and God's desire to be forever connected with his creation at every level has been severed by sin. And God has been trying from then until now to re-establish that living, vital, very, very real connection with that which he created from mankind all the way down to the last level of creation. Because God is not happy being separated from his creation. He is not happy. Separation was never part of God's plan. Relationship was God's plan. When he made man, he made him to depend on him. When he made the creatures of the earth and gave them the same breath of life, he made them to depend on him. Let us see how the Bible expresses the degree to which the animal kingdom is dependent upon God. Psalm 104, let's read verse 29. Psalm 104, verse 29. What can you tell me about Psalms? Anything at all about the book of Psalms? It is the longest of the books of the Bible, and the books of the Bible total how many? 66. How many in the New Testament? How many in the New Testament? How many in the Old? Yes, if I ask you this question tomorrow night, I want a chorus of responses, all correct, of course. 39 in the Old, 27 in the New. Psalm is the longest of the 66. It is not really a book, it is a collection of songs. So Psalm does not have chapters. Psalm has what? Divisions, but not chapters. But we'll call them chapters. Psalm 104, verse 29. Here's what David says of the animal world. Thou hidest thy face. They are what? Troubled. Mm -hmm. Thou takest away their breath. They do what? Die and do what? Return where? To their dust. In other words, they return to the same place of origin from which Adam came. It may be a little embarrassing to know that physiologically, there's no difference between us and animals. The Bible goes so far as to say we die the same way. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Now you are in Psalms. The next book is Proverbs. The next book is Ecclesiastes. So you're not far away from Ecclesiastes. Going, of course, to your right. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, chapter 3. Let's read verse 19. Do you have Ecclesiastes 3.19? The Bible says, For that which befalleth the sons of men, befalleth what? Beasts. What does befall mean? To happen. What happens to people, happens to animals. Even, how many things befall them? One thing, as one dieth, finish it for me, so dieth the other. Now, read that next statement. Yea, they have all one breath. God said that, speaking through the wise man, not me. The breath in that coyote you try to shoot is the same breath in me. Now, the coyote was not made in the image of God. Therein lies the profound difference. I was made in his image. Consequently, I was made with the capacity to develop a character like God. The animal kingdom was not. But take away the character of God, and all you have are animals. Four legs and two legs. And in times of crisis, you see that. It does not take much for people to descend to the level of animals. It does not take much, up to and including cannibalism. 
What really separates us from the animals is the capacity to develop the character of God and the pursuing of that capacity to its fullest limit. The development and the reflection of my creator in my life so that every created person is a billboard for the goodness of God. That's the connection God desires with you individually. And I shall expand on this tomorrow night when I say individually. Let me give you a glimpse of tomorrow night's message. How individual is God in his relationship one with the other? Let's go to Psalm 147. Come two books to your left. Psalm 147. It's uh, 19 minutes after 8. We're reading verse 4. Psalm 147, reading verse 4 as we continue. A marriage made in heaven. The marriage being the relationship between God and everything he has created. The Bible says, he telleth the number of the stars. What does telleth mean in that verse? He counts. Finish the verse for me. He calleth them all, how? By their names. Now how many stars are they? Billions. Let me tell you something about the stars. Go to Jeremiah 33. Let's read verse 22. Don't lose Psalm 147 verse 4. Jeremiah 33, reading verse 22. As we continue, a marriage made in heaven. And a man or a woman who lives outside of that connection with God is living a very dangerous life. Do you have Jeremiah 33? Do you have verse 22? What does it say? As the host of heaven, what? Cannot be numbered, stop. But Psalm 147 verse 4 says, He telleth the number of the stars. Do we have a conflict between two Bible verses? Oh, well, one man says yes, who's not a member of the church. He says yes, we have a conflict. No, there's no conflict. Let's see the explanation. Go to Genesis 15. Genesis 15, let's clear this up. Psalm 147 verse 4 says, He telleth the number of the stars, he counts them. Jeremiah 33 verse 22 says, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered. Now we're going to Genesis 15. In this chapter, God appears to Abraham and tells him he'll have a son. From his own bowels. And in verse 5, the Bible says, This is God, what he does to Abraham. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and do what? Tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. <laughs> Abraham if you, as a human being, can count the stars, go ahead. Could Abraham count them? Absolutely not. But can the creator who made them count them? Yes. Jesus counts the stars because Jesus Christ made a finite number of stars and he knows exactly how many stars and every star has a name. Now that's a personal relationship. You know what the stars of the heavens are usually compared with? The sands of the sea. Can you count the sands of the sea? Mm -mm. You know what Jesus can? <laughs> can you count the stars in the heavens? Jesus can. Now, what kind of a God is Christ, who is the creator? That he knows every individual star in the universal expanse. I've met some people with so many children, they forgot how many they have. Confuse the names. Whenever I go to see my mother, don't tell I said that. She calls me Brian, that's my brother's name. When my brother Brian goes to see her, she says, hello Randy. Confuse it, not Jesus Christ. He knows the name of every star. Why? Because he named them. And the act of naming in scripture is the act of establishing a relationship of leadership and responsibility. I don't want to give you too much of tomorrow night's sermon, but some of you may not come back. Let me just give you a little more from tomorrow night. Go with me to the book of Matthew.
First book of the, of the New Testament. What can you tell me about Matthew? What work did he do before he collided with Jesus? He was a tax collector. Give me another word for tax collector. A publican, give me another word. A thief, yes. A very, very skillful thief. But he met Jesus Christ. Now, I won't ask if there are any thieves in here. But whatever you are, if you will meet Christ, he can change you radically. So Matthew wrote the fourth gospel. A thief. One of the most hated people in that society. The publicans hated. He met Christ. Now he gives us guidance on how to live spiritual lives. From a thief to a theologian, God can do that for you. Matthew 10, reading verse 29. What does the Bible say? Are not what? You don't have it. Matthew 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for what? A farthing, and one of them shall not do what? Without your father. Now, what does this mean? Do you know what a farthing is? You don't. You didn't live in a British country? Up until the early 70s, the British used pounds, shillings, and pence. And a farthing was one of the most negligible coins you could find. You know when you go to gas stations, you buy the gas, you go to pay, the guy gives you five single dollars or three and gives you one penny. What do you do with the penny? You drop it in that little thing where they keep pennies? Who wants a penny? I was coming through Heathrow Airport in London earlier this year on my way from Africa. Stopped into a store to buy something and the woman gave me some little few British pennies. So I told her, keep them. She said, no, 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 I can't keep them. Come back and get them. So I came back and got them. And, but I didn't want them. What am I doing with two or three pennies? Although pennies add up. <laughs> Jesus says, are not two sparrows now? Let's focus on sparrows. How many people are worried about sparrows? No one here is worried about sparrows. I know that. Don't try to look all godly. You're not worried about sparrows. You're not. In Africa, there's a bird called the Quila bird. It flies in such huge flocks. When it flies, it looks like a moving black cloud. Constantly switching, changing shapes. The farmers try to kill them, waste of time. They multiply like locusts. The Bible says, when one of them dies, what happens in heaven? God knows. Now just pause. What kind of God is that? And how dare you think he doesn't care about you? Now the queen of bird was not made in God's image. When one falls to the ground, that's what, die, dead, God knows. Let's see that expressed in Luke. Luke chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. Luke 12, 6 and 7, we continue. A marriage made in heaven is 8.25. Do you have Luke 12? Luke is the third member of the gospel quartet. Tell me something about Luke. He was a physician. Tell me something else. We talked about Luke last night. Tell me something else about Luke. He was the only non-Jewish writer of all the writers of the Bible and he traveled with Paul. That's why in the book of Acts you sometimes see Luke saying, we, because he traveled with Paul quite frequently. Luke 12, verse 6 tells us what? Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And what? One of them, not one of them is forgotten. That's right. Not only does God notice when they're dead, even before they're dead, God is conscious and aware of everyone. Now I realize we're too sophisticated to waste time thinking of sparrows and we have more scientific things to do. But the Bible teaches us that God is so caring. And this creator is Jesus Christ. We'll come to that tomorrow. It's Christ. The same person on the cross. By the way, the sermon for tomorrow is, who was that man on the cross? God cares so much that every star is named, and I'll repeat that tomorrow, whenever any of his creatures dies, God notices. Let me say something else about giving a name. What does a name do to you? What does a name, why do people have names? Identification. 
makes you different from the other person. In naming every star, of course, God asked Adam to name all the animals. So in that sense, Adam was acting like God, you see, establishing a relationship with the created world over which God gave him dominion, not ownership. Because with dominion, Adam had to give an account to God. That's one form of ongoing relationship. With ownership, Adam did not have to report to anyone. Are you following me? God gave him dominion or stewardship. A steward has to report. That's one way God ensured an ongoing relationship. An owner has to report to no one. As steward of the created world, Adam named the animals the same way Adam's creator named all the heavenly bodies. Now, with each heavenly body named, with each created creature named, Adam and God were establishing individual relationships. <laughs> you know what that means? Let's forget the stars for a minute. Do you know what it means individual relationship those of you who have counseled I've counseled most of my life and one of the challenges of counseling particularly if you're going through a series may say from 4 to 8 when I do crusades I counsel during the day 9 to 12, 9 to 1 and one of the great challenges for me is when one person walks out and the next person walks in to deal with that person who came in second or third as if that's the first person I'm seeing are you listening to me now when God deals with you, and he always is, God deals with us as if we are the only person alive on the face of the earth. Amen. Come on, let's have more amens than that. Amen. Now that's individual attention. How many people commit suicide because they can't get attention? How many children act out because they can't get attention? How many wives go on spending binges or men on spending binges because they get no attention from the opposite side? How many students fail deliberately because they get no attention from busy parents? We need attention. We thrive and God gives us an individual attention that blocks out every other living thing on the face of the earth. That's the kind of bond God always had in mind for us. That bond grew out of love. Love requires relationship. Love requires interaction. Love is always outward in its expression. That's why they had to have been a Godhead. <laughs> so they can love each other. Can't have one God to love whom? Love must have an object. Must have an object. God's love for Jesus is the love he expresses towards us. That's the marriage or the bond formed in heaven. Let me show you how serious God is about making sure that we're always connected with heaven if we desire that. Because we can tell him no. When Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying, the Bible says in Luke 22, about a stone's cast from the disciples. What were the disciples doing? Sleeping. What did Jesus want them to do? Pray. Pray for me. Recite some Old Testament verses. Remind me of why I came. You know, support me. I need to have a connection with my disciples in this critical hour. They were sleeping. The Bible says God sent an angel from heaven. Strengthening him. That wasn't the first time. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 11. After the devil tried to tempt Christ. And Christ fended him off using the Bible. The verse 11 tells us. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold angels came and ministered unto him. God will not leave a child of his alone. If God cannot touch some human heart. To go support one of his children. God will send an angel. And that's no joke. That's not symbolic language. That's not hyperbole. That is literal biblical fact. As a child of God, in honor of his desire for connection that's unbroken, God will always find a way to support you and to stand by you. Because this was his original desire when he made Adam and Eve and the natural world. God wants to have a relationship with you God misses us when we drift.
My mother would love me to come down to her home every day. Drive three hours one way, three hours back, every day. She fusses when I don't call if I miss a day. Fusses and I hear the fussing all the time. Can recite the fussing word for word, but I hear it. Why? Because she misses her firstborn son. Parents, why is it so hard for you to let your children go off to college? You miss them. With all the headaches and the heartaches and the ulcers they gave you, you miss them. But when they come home, you're the most excited people in the universe. When husbands come back from Iraq and war, wherever they went, wives come to the runway, they can't wait on the terminal, on the runway. Children running to the plane. Why? To greet daddy, father, husband, brother, cousin, nephew. Why? I missed you. God misses us. 33 minutes after 8. Is there someone under the sound of my voice who believes perhaps that God misses you? Because you have drifted from him? He misses you. This world is no place to be running around alone, apart from God. I want to tell you tonight, with all the sincerity I can muster by the Spirit of God, God misses us. When we leave Him, God desires that He would have a relationship with us that is vital and vibrant, ongoing, and that is not endangered by the attractions of the world. God wants us, as Rodney King said, to get along. That's what he wants. Let me tell you, what God wants for you is what you ought to want for yourself. Because of our limited vision, we can't see that. But what God desires for us is what we would desire for ourselves if our eyes could be open to behold that which is now unseen. But this constant contact is our guarantee of a happy life, a fruitful life, and a life that will go from this to that. Isn't God good? Come on, say amen. It's, God is good and I love God. Love Him a lot. Sorry I hurt Him so much. I love God a lot. Love Jesus. Love the Holy Ghost. Love the angels. Love God's people. Tonight, I must ask you from my heart, how many of you will say sincerely, Lord, I want to have that living, vital connection with you that you desire so much. If this is your prayer, could you raise your right hand? I want to have that. Stand up with me. As the song says, I love you, Lord. Such a privilege to have the creator of the universe as a mentor to take us through life, guide us through difficulties, instruct us in moments of perplexity. The God of heaven and earth, he who sees the beginning from the end, is best equipped and qualified to guide us step by step as to how we should live a life that to us is uncertain, but in God's hand is certain. Every head bowed, every eye closed reverently. Father in heaven, I ask you from my heart and in the name of Jesus to take the words I have spoken in my frail and feeble way and multiply the power of my utterances and then take the words home with concussive force to every heart and to every mind, dear God, that someone may respond to this gospel of love. It is well nigh impossible to fully conceive how the God of the universe desires to have individual relationships with us and misses us when we go astray. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, lay a heavy impression upon every heart that as we leave this sacred place, we may leave with the determination in our hearts that we will pursue a life-giving relationship with Jesus Christ, a bond, a connection, yea, a marriage made in heaven. For this is what God desires for us. Father, if there's someone here who does not know Christ, I ask you to reveal yourself to him and to her. Father, make it possible for those who are here tonight to come back tomorrow when the message will be, who was that man on the cross? 
I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name and for his sake, let all God's people say, Amen.